Please take your Bibles and go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you would, please. 1 Timothy chapter 2. This will probably be the last message that we give in this second chapter as we move on into chapter 3 and following in the book of 1 Timothy. So I'd like to begin reading by uh, verses 9 to 15 through verses 9 to 15. We'll be turning uh, after this to Genesis chapter 1 in our reading. And you might think that I'm going to be plowing uh, the fields that we've already been plowing before uh, in prior lessons, but I am going to really handle uh, from verse 9 uh, actually from verse 10 to verse 15 that we haven't really spent time on as we really spent a lot of time in verse 9 talking about uh, the adornment and modest apparel and so on in regards to uh, the uh, lady's dress and so on. So I've entitled the message, The Blessing of Womanhood. You know, we are so far removed in many of our uh, ways of looking at things as believers because we've been programmed by the world and by the woke Christianity that's around today, that when we begin to look at the template given to us in the Word of God, it seems so far removed from the reality of life as we know it. And so it's hard for us to sort of picture how everything fits together, and yet we are to follow the pattern that God has established. When Moses went into Mount Sinai, God showed him the temple and said, I want you to go down off this mountain and I want you to build the tabernacle just as you see it here in heaven. And so there's a pattern that's been established for us. And that's why we have 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy deals with the aspect of how the local churches operate in the public services, the things that we're supposed to hold to doctrinally, as well as how to flesh that out, how to practice those things. And that's why we're spending such time in these six chapters because of the fact that when you look at the modern day church, it's many times uh, far removed from the pattern established for us in the Word of God. Let me read this portion of Scripture. It says, In like manner also, this is verse 9 of 1 Timothy 2, it says, That women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So once again, I believe that the, there has been what we would say is demonic or dark forces at work to try to pit God's creation against one another. And I'm talking about the male and the female. We must remember that mankind, meaning male and female, right, were created the same day by God, the Creator, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. And I'd like us to go there. And we also need to understand that when He saw His creation, after the six days of creation, He looked at all that He had done and He said, Behold, it's very good. He didn't just say it was good. He didn't say it was okay. He said it's very good. Let's see what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1. And this is also a reason why you have such an attack on the book of Genesis today where a lot of modern day theologians have tried to dispute some of the events and some of the happenings and historical setting for the book of Genesis. But they keep coming up short because even modern day archaeology continues to uh, show forth the artifacts and so on that add credence to what is recorded to us in the book of Genesis. But here it says in verse 26, it says, uh, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And drop down here to verse 31 of Genesis 1. And it says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. We learn from chapter 2, the first opening verses of Scripture, that God rested on the seventh day. And so we see the seven days of creation, and we believe in the literal 24-hour day. And we don't believe there was great periods of time uh, between each day of creation. So God placed them together, the man and the woman, the male and the female, He placed them together in the Garden of Eden. If you'll look at chapter 2, this is not speaking of another creation. It's talking and just expanding on a certain aspect of the creation that we have recorded for us in succinct form in chapter 1. Look, if you would, at chapter 2 and verse 21. And it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. There they are in innocency. There you see the openness and transparency uh, in a marriage union. And notice right here at creation, God called Adam and Eve husband and wife. And so it's important for us to see that distinction that God is not only the creator of man and woman, but he is also the institutor of marriage. So marriage is of God. That's why we go to the pastor or to a church to be married, because it is God, it's to be God-ordained. That's why we don't run to the justice of the peace, to the government for that stamp of approval, because God is the one who institutes marriage. And so we honor Him by honoring creation. And of course, fulfilling our God-given roles also, if you're a man, you fulfill the role of a man. If you're a woman, you fulfill the role of a woman. And so that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. But the fall that you find happening here in Genesis chapter 3, we see that it brings sin, it brought misery, it brought chaos, it brought trouble. And so we have to deal now uh, with the confusion that sin has caused in all aspects of God's creation. We now have to deal with our own sin nature as well as the consequences of the sin nature passed down, yes, from generation to generation, but the consequences that actually covers all of God's creation. Everything that we look at today, if you could go to what they would say is the most beautiful part of God's earth and say, look how gorgeous this is. It's so untouched by man and your eyes gaze upon the horizon there and you say how beautiful it is, it too has been tainted by sin. It's going to be amazing when we see the new heaven and the new earth. It's going to be amazing when we see everything in its pure form. I think it's going to be hard to comprehend. Amen. I don't think the half, as the scripture says, has been told. Now, we have to deal, yes, as I said, with the consequences today of our own sin, but also Adam and Eve's. Let's go here to chapter 3 of Genesis, and let's look here in verse 9. And I'm going to begin reading here, and it says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? You may say, why are we st spending this time in Genesis? Well, if you'll remember back, and we'll refresh your memory when we get back here to 1 Timothy chapter 2, because this event that we're reading about is mentioned here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So we've, we've got to bring the two together to make sure that we're on track, scripturally speaking, in our philosophy and our doctrine and our practice as Bible believers. It says here again in verse 10, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. 
And of course, mankind, sin came in. And of course, there was that shame then of his nakedness. And uh, then it goes in verse 11, and he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. It's hard to imagine what the snake must have looked like in its beauty before sin came in. But now, you notice most people when they see a snake writhing on the ground, they run the other direction. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing. Most people will scream and run. I can remember going up uh, years ago with the family, and we went up to, oh, what's that area where they have all the garter snakes? That, was it Nars? How do you say it? Nars Narciss? Is it Narciss? It's, I, I guess I'm confusing that with a, a mental problem, too. Uh, in Narciss, and I hope I'm saying it right. If not, it's Jeff's fault. And, uh, so anyway, um, I went up there and there's tens of thousands of snakes and they're just writhing around and, and all that. And you know, um, it's pretty gory to just think of, of all that. And uh, when I was uh, in, uh, not quite, well, I was in high school, uh, I had a dog named Prissy and we, <laughs> Prissy, <laughs> uh, I won't tell you what kind of dog it was because you wouldn't believe me. But anyway, now I got you wondering. And we would go down to the creek bed and we would try to find water moccasins. And uh, we would get those and, and so on. And, you know, we, we like to catch snakes and we like to scare people with them. And uh, so on. But, you know, they're not really a reptile that you really think of being a pet as such. I know some people have them as pets. But most people run from them. But here we find in the garden before sin came in, that the serpent probably was a beautiful creature of God. And of course, uh, the, Satan uh, you know, used that, that serpent, and he's also throughout Scripture likened unto a serpent. And it says, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, verse 14, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So when you're mowing the grass this spring and all the dandelions are coming up, you can thank Adam for that. It says, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So we see that the consequences that we are going through today, the work we go through and the, the sweat we go through and the tainted of sin and how everything's now an effort for us, uh, we find that that's a consequence of sin upon mankind and upon our world. So we see that God's original intent was for man and woman, though, to fellowship with God. They were placed in the garden. They were placed in the garden, and the Bible says to dress it, and to keep it. That's in Genesis chapter 2. And so we find that mankind was made to work. Uh, that's why it says in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus Christ took on him the form of a servant made in the likeness of man. And so we see that Jesus Christ became a man, a servant. We are servants. So even before the fall, we were to be servants. We were to serve the Lord, doing what he placed us here to do in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 28. So we see that was God's original intent for mankind. 
So, we also find not only were they created to fellowship and to dress and keep the garden, but they were to perpetuate creation by bearing children. Look what it says in chapter 4 here in Genesis. Uh, it says here, and Adam knew his wife Eve. That means an intimate knowledge of. That's talking about the consummation of the marriage. And it says here, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. You go back to uh, uh, Psalms 127 where it says children are a heritage of the Lord. Now we know because of sin and the sin nature, we find that Cain slew his brother Abel. But here we find that at the birth, uh, she recognized, Eve did, that hey, God had given her a child. And so there are no uh-ohs with God. Now he may, he's not gonna force his will on us. Mankind will ultimately make the choice as to whether they will accept Christ or reject Christ, whether they will serve him or dishonor him, that's man's choice. And here we see that Adam and Eve were created in innocency. God indeed was their creator, and yet they rebelled against God. We find here in Genesis chapter four, you have Cain being born, verse two, and she bare, again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And we know as we read on in that passage of scripture that uh, Cain killed Abel. He committed murder. And so right away you see that here are two children growing up with two uh, parents. And of course they had the greatest of environment to begin with. They also had a mom and dad that had applied the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to them with Jesus uh, killing innocent animals and covering their nakedness as a symbol of the redemption of mankind. And here we find that in the obstinacy of their heart and the free will that God had given, they made a choice. Uh, Cain made a choice to kill Abel. And it says here also, if you'll drop down to verse uh, 25, he says, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So here we find the, the righteous seed being raised up again. The devil all the way from creation has tried to thwart God's plan of redemption. And so with the killing of Abel, there was that seed that was cut off, yet God provided another in Seth. And through the godly line of Seth, we ultimately see the Messiah coming, amen? And so what a, what a wonderful picture it is as you see this trail, what we call the scarlet thread that weaves its way through the scriptures, amen? And so it's, it, the Bible just fits if we rightly divide it, amen? And so we notice that it was through a woman that the Redeemer would come and bring salvation to all mankind. If you'll notice here, if you'll go back to Genesis chapter three, in verse 15, <clears throat> this is the first mention we have of the promised Messiah. He says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. If you'll go back to our text passage of scripture in chapter two and verse 15, it says here, 1 Timothy 2:15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. There are two basic interpretations of this particular passage of scripture that I want to give you tonight. And it's, the first one is that the salvation mentioned is from doctrinal error and warns against women teaching deceptions. And of course we get that if you look here in our text of 1 Timothy, it says here, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed in Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so the first salvation, salvation doesn't always mean salvation from hell. Salvation, another definition of that is a salvaging of a life, a salvaging as well. 
If you look at the second a primary interpretation of this passage of scripture, Paul is saying that while it was a woman which paved the way for the corruption in Eden, it was also a woman who paved the way for the incarnation in Bethlehem. In other words, because of uh, Eve's deception, uh, we knew, know that Adam walked into sin with his eyes wide open. Uh, Eve was totally tricked. She was deceived. And so Adam, he knew exactly what he was doing, as well as God held Adam responsible. It's not Eve's fault. It's actually Adam's fault. And when God came calling, he came calling for Adam and held him ultimately responsible as we see, even as he uh, put the curse on mankind in regards to the man and his curse, the woman and hers, and then the curse of creation as well because of that sin. But it's interesting because of that particular uh, sin happening in Genesis chapters three and four, we find uh, that also it was through Mary, uh, the woman, that the promised seed would come to bring salvation to mankind, amen? So it's wonderful how it all just sort of dovetails together in this passage of scripture. But that's why uh, it's so important to compare scripture with scripture when you come across a passage that seems to present some difficulty, it's important for us to go and find the clear teaching of the Word of God to actually give insight to those things that don't seem to quite gel with us. You should never just dive into a passage of Scripture, pull a verse out and say, this is it. Uh, you can use passages of Scripture like that for supporting uh, documentation but at the same time, you need to find the primary interpretation of each verse of Scripture. Remember, every verse has a primary interpretation, but it may have a multiplicity of applications, as we find in the Word of God. And so, let's look at verses 9 and 10 once again as we work our way through this passage of Scripture. Hopefully you can see why I've been spending some time here, because there's such misunderstanding today. You come across a passage of scripture like this, and if you look at the modern day news movement, for example, you'll find that they just come unglued when you come to a passage of scripture like this. And uh, the feminist movement is just, this passage of scripture is anathema with them. They like to ignore this totally. But this is really a, a passage of scripture that actually uplifts womanhood to her glory in, in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verses 9 and 10 again, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair, gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. I wrote this, in viewing these verses, we see that godly women ought to concern themselves with their inner lives and not emphasize the outer to draw attention to their bodies. Their godly works should speak for them as well as their countenance. We looked at this last week, but I want to, for emphasis, look at it again in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, I'll begin reading here in verse 1, as soon as I get there. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, no matter what passage of scripture you go to, uh, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, you notice it will always say uh, the woman in regards, the married woman in regards to her own husband. And so that's a critical uh, addition that the Holy Spirit of God has given, okay? And so it says here that if any obey not the word, that means even the husband, if he's not going by the word of God, then there is an opportunity for the godly woman in the home to reach her husband, whether he's unsaved, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, as well as if he is saved but not walking with God, the power of influence, not with her body, but with her spirit, her countenance, and her good works. Look what it says. It says, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Not just their speech, 
but the way she carries herself, the way she conducts herself, the way, the way her attitude is, and so on. It says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Another word for fear in this context is not that a woman is to walk around slinking around the house in fear that her, of her husband. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a respect. If you go to Ephesians chapter five, the last verse of scripture says, see that the wife reverence her husband. That means to respect her husband. In verse 25 of that passage, it says that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, many times a woman would say, well, if my husband would love me like Christ loved the church, then I could respect him. But no, you're missing the boat. You're supposed to respect your husband regardless. And man, you're to love your wife regardless as Christ loved the church. You understand, we, it's interesting when he talks about love and that responsibility, you notice where it says in Romans chapter five, verse eight, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We had nothing good to offer him. We were low down, if you please, and yet Jesus Christ loved us. And so no matter what goes on in the marriage union, we ought to fulfill our God-given role. And the man is to stick by his wife no matter what. Just like Christ sticks by us. Amen? Because he is faithful. Amen. Amen, Brother Keen. Okay, notice what it says here as we uh, keep reading, if I find my place again. Uh, here in 1 Peter chapter 3. It says here, who's adorning, verse three, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair or of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. I mean, you know, look, I look a whole lot different than I did when I was in my teen years, a whole lot different than I looked when I was in my uh, 20s and 30s and 40s. Uh, let's stop with that, okay? But at the same time, you know, we are in a corruptible body. Our bodies are wearing out, they're getting older. Just like you go and buy that new car, that new truck, and it won't be long and it's not gonna be new anymore and it's gonna start having problems. It is corruptible. And so it says here, we're not to put the emphasis on that which is corruptible, okay? That's why it says also in another portion of scripture that it says that bodily exercise profiteth little doesn't mean that there's no value in it, but compared to godliness, the emphasis in our lives ought to be our godliness, not our bodies. And notice what it says here, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So who are you trying to impress with your life? It ought to be God. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And notice what it says here, which is in the sight of God of great price. And then he says, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. They, they adorned themselves with the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. It's not talking about the outward appearance. That doesn't mean a lady has to go around looking dowdy and all that, but by the same token, we need to remember to put the emphasis where God puts the emphasis. And notice he says this, he says, for after this manner the old time, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And so we see godliness evidences itself with good works, okay? Godliness evidences itself uh, with good works. And we see that in this passage of scripture, okay? Now, uh, it, where, where are those good works? Well, good works in the home. Uh, let's go to that famous portion of scripture in Proverbs chapter 31, Proverbs chapter 31. And you know, it's amazing how we've been sold as such a, a false bill of goods in regards to a man's place in society and a woman's place in society. And uh, women uh, hold an honored position in the mind and sight 
of Almighty God. And so does the man. And so we need to fulfill our God-given role. And that's where when we do what we're supposed to do, fulfilling the role that we're supposed to fill, that comes, there comes that completeness, that contentment, that sense of fulfillment, that we have done what we are supposed to do. And God is pleased with us. Who can find, verse 10, a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. What I'm trying to get you to see tonight is that God is not looking down on the women of our day. And uh, we somehow, if we're Bible believers, we sometimes give the impression that men are superior to the women. And nothing could be further from the truth. We've already looked at scripture where there's neither, well, I'll show you that in a minute from uh, Galatians chapter 3. But at the same time, we see that, that uh, God honors a, a woman here in this passage of Scripture. He's all for it. <laughs> I mean, he used Mary to come into this world, right? He says, her, her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Ladies, can your husband trust you? And I'm not talking about, you know, just in, in the matter of, of fidelity uh, in, in the sexual aspect of your marriage. I'm talking about in every area of life. Can he trust you? You're not one of those in Proverbs that pluck down your house with your hands, are you? I trust not. But notice here in this passage of scripture, motherhood is being lifted up. Womanhood is being lifted up. He says, look uh, uh, here, he writes, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand, she planted the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Guys, if, you're, if you don't consult your wife in matters of life and living, uh, you are missing out on a treasure that God has given you. And that is found in the word of God. She can give you insight in the running of your home, in the purchasing of things, even lands and business de uh, decisions. She can add such a perspective that you may very well miss in your obstinacy and in your bullheadedness. Ooh, okay. She, listen, verse 17, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. That means he's respected. He's looked up to. When he sitteth among the elders of the land. Why? One of the reasons is because he's got a good wife. And it says, and she makes him look good. And she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. So here we see that the lady's good works in the home just really adds credence to and, and blessing and gives glory to God through the fulfillment of her role as a woman as well as good works in the church we find, as we find in the text here. He's not saying that women have no place in the church, that they can't do anything in the church, and there's no good in their second class and so on. No, he has a structure. 
And so we find that many women were mightily used of God in the work of the churches. You look at Romans 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, other portions of scripture as well. And so we find that we're, the, the, the issue that's being mentioned here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 is one I call, I say of structure, not superiority. Let's look, at, I told you we'd go to Galatians chapter three. We'll do that real quick like and look at a verse. Uh, Galatians chapter three and uh, verse uh, 28. 328, I'll get right to the reading. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So obviously God is not gonna play favorites. Man, if you're a man, fulfill your role. You're, you'll make God happy if you're a man doing what a man's supposed to do. And woman, you're gonna make God happy if you do what a woman's supposed to do. That's what the Bible teaches. And that's the point he's trying to make here in this passage of scripture. But don't swallow the world's philosophy or liberal uh, Christian theology don't swallow their teaching in regards to that women are no good and they're oppressed and suppressed. No, don't do that. Follow the scriptures. We find that many women spread the news of the resurrected Christ. Remember, it was the women that came first to the, the tomb to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus. And they went after they saw that Jesus Christ was was uh, resurrected, they went and spread the word. They went and told the disciples. We find Dorcas in Acts chapter nine, served the uh, church. Lydia in Acts chapter 16 was used of God. Priscilla in Acts chapter 18, we find her serving alongside of her husband as they started a church, as they would travel from community to community with the apostle Paul to hold up his hands provide food for him, income for him, so that he could do the work of the ministry. We find here in Acts chapter 17, verses 4 and 12, other godly women mentioned in the Berean and Thessalonian churches. We find Phoebe was the one who actually carried the letter of the book of Romans uh, to its destination in Romans chapter 16 in verse 1. So don't tell me that women are inferior and that God can't use them and somehow it's all about the men. It's not about the men. It's just here we find that God says, I've got an order that you need to pay attention to and this is the reason why the men ought to be fulfilling this role and women this particular role and he lays that out for us. Look at verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Oh man, some... Some guys really jump on verses of scripture like this, that woman can't do anything, can't say anything, and you're just supposed to stay in the kitchen and keep your mouth shut. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. And it doesn't mean that you can't come in and you can't pray and that you can't testify. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that you are not to be in the place of teaching Bible truth to a general congregation filled with men because that is the man's role. And if you think that that's so tough, Wait till we get to chapter three of the book of First Timothy, because he lays out the qualifications for a pastor in verses one to seven, verses eight to 13, the qualifications of a deacon, and they're pretty stringent. You think it's tough on the women, wait till we get to the men. Wow. Now, the word learn here in this passage of scripture is what we call the present active imperative. An imperative is a command. And it says here, which means that women are to learn the word of God. <laughs> Ladies, you're to know your Bibles. Sometimes we emphasize guys, know your Bible, you know. But ladies are to learn the Bible. Notice when uh, Timothy was growing up, he didn't have a dad. Acts chapter 16, growing up in the home. So it fell to grandma and it fell to mama. And what they did is they instilled the word of God in old Timothy. Amen. I mean, put the word of God in him and made that boy the man that he grew up to be under the tutelage of the apostle Paul. But Paul, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, just praises uh, Lois and Eunice, the grandma and the mother, that they were godly enough to instill Christian character and the word of God into that boy. And so we see that here. Here's what Barclay writes in regards to this passage of scripture. 
Now understand, stay here with me because it's going to sound like I'm counteracting what I've been said, but let me finish. Now Barclay writes, the respectable Greek woman led a very confined life. She lived in her own quarters into which no one but her husband came. She did not even appear at meals. She never at any time appeared on the street alone. She never went to any public assembly. Some women reacting to this mindset went to the extreme and sought a dominant role in the worship service. And God is putting things in its proper order here. You see, we have this tendency to do the pendulum swing. Someone does something to an extreme, so then we go right over here to the other extreme. And what God is saying, let your moderation be known unto all men, for God, Christ is at hand. That's Philippians 4, 5, I believe. And so here we find that Barclay is writing such, and there's some abuse that's taking place. And so here, Timothy uh, is being told by the Apostle Paul, hey, you make sure that uh, the order of God's creation is maintained in the public services of the church. And so he lays that out. Subjection does not mean, as we said, superiority. Subjection means order or rank. And we, find, we found from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, the first few verses of Scripture, it tells us that the head of the woman is the man. But the head of the man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. And so you see, God has a structure even in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's an order that God has established. Uh, we already pointed out in a prior lesson that God had an order in creation. And how everything, because of the way creation was worked out, day one, day two, day three, it just mapped out just perfectly for it all to fit together and work properly. Amen? And we see that in the church as well. Usurp. Here's what it means to usurp. It says in verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Usurp means to govern, to exercise dominion over one, one who acts on his own authority. You know, you remember when you go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, God says, here's one of the consequences of your sin in the garden. And he laid it out for the man. He laid it out for the woman. The husband will rule over you. And so the rub for mankind because of sin is the man is going to be weak. The tendency in a sin condition and carnality to be weak in leadership. And the woman's going to be weak in fellowship. She's going to be weak in submission. And so the rub many times in marriages is poor leadership in the home as well as poor fellowship in the home. Subjection in the home. That's why God says to your own husbands, to your own husbands. And so we can argue till the cows come home, but that's God's order. God has established it. And so we need to not worry so much about whether the other person is fulfilling their role we need to make sure that we are fulfilling our role. Amen? God's going to fulfill his role. You can mark that down. Amen? So we see there, God has a place for all creation, and the place of a woman in the public services is that of a learner, not a teacher. But this does not mean that she can't teach. Uh, you know, in Acts chapter 18, Here's Apollos, he's preaching, and he's from a prior dispensation. He's preaching that the Messiah's coming. And boy, he knows those Old Testament scriptures, and he's rattling them off. And he's got, he, the Bible says he's eloquent in his speech. And so Aquila and Priscilla listen to this, and they say, you know what? He's talking about Jesus. He doesn't realize that Jesus has come already. The Messiah has come. So what do they do after he got through speaking? They pulled him aside. The husband and wife team pulled him aside, opened up the scriptures, and taught him privately what the Word of God said. He embraced Christ, the knowledge of Christ, as the Messiah, and then he went out and he preached Christ. Amen? You see that. Also, if you'll just flip over here real quite, quick, like to Titus chapter 2, it tells us and gives us, and Titus is another pastoral epistle, but it is also teaching, it's a leadership book is what I'm trying to say. And it teaches uh, Christian leadership, pastoral leadership. And he says this, look what it says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is healthy doctrine. It's the best doctrine, it's teaching. That's what doctrine means. 
he says, that the aged men, that'd be the old men of our congregation. Guys, you may have retired from your job, but you shouldn't retire from Christianity and the influential role that you hold. It says that the aged men be sober. That means seriously minded. That means clear headed. He says grave, temperate, sounded faith in charity, in patience. And so that's how we ought to be. That's our attitude <laughs> and everything that wrapped up in one. Verse three, look at that. The aged women likewise. And it says these words, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. It says, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And here's what they're to teach, that they may teach the young women to be sober. First of all, they need to be right. The aged men need to be right personally. The aged women need to be right personally. Then they establish a platform from which to teach the younger. You know, you can't go out and live like the devil and then expect the younger ones to listen to you, uh, you know, give them a lecture on how they ought to be doing things differently and doing right. You don't have a platform. You don't have the wherewithal to be able to give them any kind of advice at all. It's going to go in one ear and out the other. That's why you get godly. <laughs> You walk with God, you learn the word of God, and then as they view your righteous life, you develop a platform from which you can teach the word of God. And the deacons are told about that in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now notice what it says here, I, I don't want to get on that. Uh, verse 4, and they, uh, that they may teach the young women to be sober. So I'm just talking about, we, you know, we think sober, okay, so I'm not going to go get drunk. It means clear headed. It means a, a clear mind. You're, you're not under the influence of anything else. It says to love their husbands. Older ladies, you can teach the younger ladies to love their husbands. Well, one of the best ways to do that is you love your husband. And then it says to love their children. They're not rug rats. They're not hassles. They may cause you hassles from time to time, but they're not a hassle. You follow me? And it says here, you just need to understand that those times, uh, children are a heritage of the Lord. Amen? And then verse five, to be discreet, chaste. Now this is what the older ladies are to teach the younger ladies. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, Obedient, uh-oh, to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, and it goes on from there. But notice verse 7, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, to be followed. So the older in the congregation ought to be a pattern for the younger to follow. And that keeps perpetuating itself as we get older and the next generation comes up. We continue that pattern. And so we see that the older women teaching the younger women. And so there, just because a woman is not to stand behind this sacred desk and preach to the men and to a mixed congregation does not mean that they don't have an important role to fulfill. Because as we know, even in the makeup of the home, the man uh, you know, ideally goes out, he makes the living, He's outside the home, the woman's at home with the children, and she has such a power of influence in the lives of those children. Amen. And every man here knows that the woman, your wife, has a power of influence in your life. And that's why it behooves the woman to understand that leadership, in one respect, there's a definition, a famous definition out there, I think John Maxwell has it, where he says, leadership is influence. And so a woman carries a lot of influence. And so you need to make sure that you hold that influence in a godly fashion. Because many men will cave eventually under the terrible onslaught of that continual dripping in your home. And so you need to understand the power of influence. And so the man needs to understand his responsibility as the leader, the godly leader. It's sad to say that many families are in their churches today because of the women and not because of the men. Uh, nowadays, it's also because of the children. Well, you know, we're going to go to that church because of the kids. 
No, the man ought to say, look, that's where the word of God is taught. That's where the Bible is held to. And so this is the best thing for our family. And so our family is going to go where the word of God is upheld. That's the man's responsibility. Okay. And so we see how that's worked out there. And I'm just about done, obviously. Okay. And so it says, uh, look at verse 14. If you go back to our text passage of scripture, I say this in verse 14, it says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And I say that this, that man rejected God's order. Adam followed his wife, disobeyed God and brought sin and death into the world. For by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In other words, Adam sinned with full knowledge of what he was doing. We call that willful disobedience. Adam willfully chose to disobey God. Eve was deceived. She opened herself up to the lie of the devil, believed his lie. And that's why many times our carnality and our sinfulness is wrapped up in a series of lies. We believe lies. And so Eve was deceived. She was the one that was cheated. She was tricked. And so what we're finding out here is other passages of scripture. We don't have time to develop it right now, but at the same time, we're finding that there's safety in maintaining God's order. God's order in the home, there's safety. If a woman is operating properly in her home under the, the headship of her husband, even according to 1 Peter chapter 3, we find if he's not just got every uh, I dotted and every T crossed the way you think it ought to be crossed, you still have God's divine order in place. The only time you're given credence to disobey any kind of godly authority is when they clearly go against the scripture. Not your interpretation of scripture, but what uh, scripture clearly espouses. Amen. And so there's safety in God's order in the home and church. And once again, we look at verse 15 as I close out. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So obviously, just by this verse of scripture, it's not talking about contextually, as well as this verse of scripture alone, that a woman is saved by bearing children. She's not going to go to heaven because she bears children. So obviously it's talking about something else. This is the solution of bringing sin into the world is the bearing of children and raising up a godly seed to win others to Jesus Christ. And how is that done? The woman teaches in the home that faith, that's that body of truth that teach the scriptures uh, there at home. We find charity, there's those acts of benevolence, that's the love in action, that's acts of kindness in the home. You have a loving atmosphere in your home, you're establishing that in your home. It's not a knockdown, drag out fight from sun up to sundown, and in between that as well. There's charity that just encompasses your home. There's holiness, that's action and a life reflecting God and His will and His word. And then with sobriety, that's exercising self control. That means having a sound mind. In other words, a mindset that pleases God. You're going throughout your day, man, seeking to please God. You're going throughout your day, dear woman, seeking to please God. Children, you are to go throughout your home seeking to please God. And the way you please God is to fulfill your God-given role at home and in the church. Amen.